Content warning. This episode deals with the sexual assault and murder of a seven-year-old girl. Please proceed with caution and take care of yourself. Welcome back to True Crime Cases. I'm your host, Lainey. A few tragedies can shake a community to its core, quite like the murder of a child. It's a nightmare scenario nobody anticipates in their neighborhood, town, or even their state. Despite the rarity of such events, the death of a child has become increasingly prevalent, with a current rate of 29.5 deaths per 100,000 children, an alarming surge since 2008. According to the CDC, the leading causes of death among children aged 1 through 19 in 2021 were incidents involving firearms, car accidents, overdoses, and cancer. Shockingly, approximately 20% of child deaths resulted from firearm-related incidents, with a staggering 65% of these classified as homicides, while the remaining 35% were categorized as accidental deaths or suicides. Furthermore, 13% of total homicides were committed through methods so uncommon that they did not register in statistical analysis. However, the case we delve into today occurred half a century ago, in an era when the safety of children was far less assured. In 1979, the mortality rate stood at a chilling 58.9 deaths per 100,000 children. It was in 1973, during this precarious period, that Joan de Alessandro failed to return home, becoming yet another tragic statistic. Yet her mother refuses to let mere numbers define Joan. With each passing year, her short life gains significance. Our heartfelt gratitude extends to Lauren of the True Crime BFF podcast, who brought this case to our attention and facilitated our connection with Rosemary de Alessandro, Joan's mother. We highly recommend listening to True Crime BFF's comprehensive two-part series, which we'll link in the show notes for an in-depth exploration of this case and its intricacies. Okay. Onto the show. April 19, 1973, marked Holy Thursday, a significant day in the Christian calendar, commemorating the Last Supper, the evening preceding the crucifixion of Christ. This solemn occasion is succeeded by Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday culminating the sacred period. In observance of its religious significance, Catholic schools across the U.S. recognize it as a holiday. The de Alessandro family, led by parents Frank and Rosemary, were devout St. John the Baptist Roman Catholic Church members. Naturally, all three children attended a Catholic school, granting them a day off to enjoy. On that particular Thursday afternoon, nine-year-old Frank Jr., or Frankie, was at a friend's house, Eight-year-old Marie was engaged in a game of softball, and seven-year-old Joan was with her mother, Rosemary, at their residence in Hillsdale, New Jersey. Joan Angela de Alessandro radiated with brightness, liveliness, and determination, imprinting her personality on every facet of her life. Music held a special place in her heart, her favorite song being Ode to Joy. Eagerly anticipating her eighth birthday, she looked forward to commencing piano lessons following in the footsteps of her older sister, whose practices she avidly observed. Joan also embraced ballet lessons, infusing energy and enthusiasm into every routine, often leading the class with infectious zeal. Her fondness for the color green was evident as she exuded warmth and compassion, standing up for others in both school and her Girl Scout troop. Throughout the day, Joan, Marie, and Rosemary traversed their serene neighborhood, delivering Girl Scout cookies. The tranquility was briefly disrupted by Joan's disappointment upon encountering an absent recipient, preventing her from completing all the deliveries on her list. Therefore, when she spotted the neighbor's car passing by around 2.45 p.m., she eagerly seized the opportunity to finalize her tasks. Excitedly, she informed her mother, Rosemary, exclaiming, there's the man who's going to buy my cookies. Trusting the familiarity of the neighbor who resided nearby, Rosemary harbored no concerns as Joan skipped off with two boxes of thin mint cookies. Initially, Rosemary remained unperturbed by Joan's delayed return, attributing it to her daughter's sociable nature and penchant for spending time with friends. Moreover, she took solace in the safety precautions instilled in her children, 
confident in Joan's ability to exercise caution around strangers. However, as the hours elapsed and Marie's piano lesson commenced without Joan's presence, a sense of unease permeated the household. Aware of Joan's eagerness to attend her sister's lessons, Rosemary initiated inquiries within the neighborhood, hoping to locate her daughter. Concern deepened when no sightings or communications emerged from Joan's whereabouts. With Frank's arrival home, they promptly alerted the authorities and embarked on a frantic search. Rosemary's intuition led her to the McGowan household, the intended destination of Joan's last delivery. Despite encountering Joseph McGowan, who answered the door with an unsettling demeanor, Rosemary's suspicions remained unverified, hinging solely on intuition and Joseph's enigmatic behavior. The ensuing mobilization of law enforcement and community volunteers, including the unexpected involvement of Joseph McGowan, underscored the gravity of Joan's disappearance. Despite exhaustive search efforts, the D'Alessandro family endured an agonizing wait, devoid of any news regarding Joan's whereabouts. Their impassioned appeals to the public and widespread dissemination of Joan's image yielded no breakthroughs. All that remained certain was Joan's departure towards the McGowan residence that fateful afternoon, leaving a haunting void in her wake. Except, someone had seen something. Naturally, Rosemary informed investigators about Joan's intended destination when she was last seen, also mentioning Joseph's unusual behavior when she visited his home to inquire about Joan. When the police approached Joseph the following Friday, they found his demeanor suspicious, despite his lack of prior criminal activity. Joseph maintained he hadn't seen Joan and claimed he couldn't have been at home when she disappeared because he was at the grocery store. Although this might have served as an alibi, Joseph's inability to provide details about his grocery trip raised doubts. He claimed to have forgotten what he had purchased just 24 hours earlier. During a subsequent interview on Saturday, Joseph's responses remained inconsistent and contradictory, prompting investigators to urge him to undergo a polygraph test. While polygraph exams aren't considered reliable evidence, it provided investigators with valuable insight in this case. The results suggested deception when Joseph was questioned about his involvement in Joan's disappearance. This prompted further interrogation, during which Joseph requested to speak with the priest. The priest arrived on Sunday morning, after which Joseph confessed to the police what they had strongly suspected, his involvement in Joan de Alessandro's murder. According to his initial account, Joseph was outside his family's home cutting the grass when Joan arrived with the Girl Scout cookies. He invited her inside to get the money, but instead, he forced her downstairs into his bedroom, located in the basement. Now, a warning before we continue. The following details are distressing and troubling, and they involve sensitive topics such as assault and homicide. I always strive to minimize graphic descriptions. Please feel free to skip ahead if you find it necessary. As Joseph led Joan to his room, he then forced Joan to remove her clothes, and according to court records, he denied that he had sexually assaulted her, but indicated he did pleasure himself near her and fondled her. Following this, Joseph threw Joan to the floor and strangled her. He said that the little girl, only four feet three inches, was screaming and trying to fight him off the entire time. He continued strangling her until she stopped struggling, at which point he believed she was dead and went to find something to dispose of her body with. When he returned to the room, though, he realized Joan was still breathing. He then repeatedly hit her head on the tiled floor and tied a plastic bag around her head until she finally passed away from the series of brutal traumas he had inflicted upon her body. Joseph cleaned up the blood at the scene with pieces of his clothing and placed Joan's body in a large plastic bag before concealing the contents by wrapping her in an old couch cover. He then put her body into his car and drove to Harriman State Park, which was across the nearby border in New York State. In a wooded area, he found a large rock formation with a sizable crevice in it. He removed Joan's body from the bags, placed it into the crevice, and then dumped the bags in garbage cans along the road on his way back home. When he arrived home, he took a shower to remove any evidence, and not long after he had gotten out of the shower, he answered the door to the woman whose baby daughter he had just brutally murdered. (laughs) 
Joseph McGowan was subsequently charged with murder and held in jail on a $50,000 bail. Seven officers immediately responded to the area described by the perpetrator. Without Joseph's guidance, they might not have located Joan's body in Harriman State Park, which spans over 47,000 acres. Despite the challenging terrain, they successfully retrieved Joan's tiny body, found naked and positioned unnaturally in a crevice, with her clothes discovered nearby. As Joan's body underwent autopsy at the hospital, police chief Philip Verisco visited the de Alessandro family home. Arriving around 4.30 p.m., his presence initially sparked hope for Frank de Alessandro, who rushed out to greet him. However, the news delivered by Verisco shattered their Easter Sunday celebrations, as prayers were offered for Joan's safe return instead of celebrating her First Communion a week later. The de Alessandro family's world was forever changed by the tragic events. At autopsy, the brutality of the attack on Joan was confirmed. She had been strangled, her tiny frame bruised and battered. Despite Joseph's repeated adamant protestations that he had never completed the sexual act and sexually assaulted the little girl, the autopsy confirmed she had been assaulted by the perpetrator. The cause of death was determined as being strangulation. The medical examiner called Joan's case one of the most brutal crimes he had ever investigated. There was some debate over which crime Joseph would stand trial for. As part of a plea bargain, Joseph would have admitted to murder without a charge of sexual assault. However, Superior Court Judge Fred Gelda rejected this plea, insisting Joseph should face a charge related to sexual assault alongside the murder. The judge emphasized the sexual nature of the crime, leading to a significant difference in potential sentencing between the two charges. Eventually, the charge was settled, and the jury prepared to hear testimony on Joseph McGowan murdering Joan de Alessandro while committing or attempting to commit a rape. The trial was set to begin in June 1974, but Joseph surprised everyone by pleading guilty, bypassing the trial altogether. His defense attorney emphasized that Joseph pleaded guilty to the murder alone, denying any involvement in the sexual assault. However, since Joseph pleaded guilty, the decision now rested with the judge. Supreme Court Judge Morris Malik asked Joseph to describe the crime he admitted to. Joseph confessed to the murder and transportation of the body. Judge Malik ordered a psychiatric evaluation for Joseph and prepared for sentencing the following month, considering whether the murder was premeditated or not. One lingering question was the motive behind Joan's murder. Joseph initially claimed he killed her out of embarrassment over not having enough money to pay for the cookies, but later admitted this was false. He sometimes mentioned pedophilic urges, but denied them at other times. He also claimed he had contemplated suicide that Thursday afternoon due to dissatisfaction with his life, but shifted his focus upon Joan's arrival. Ultimately, the true motive remained elusive. Regardless, Judge Malik sentenced Joseph to life in prison for first-degree murder. However, as life sentences can be eligible for parole, Joseph could potentially seek parole after only serving 13 years of his sentence. This meant that the de Alessandro family's pursuit of justice was far from over, with Rosemary de Alessandro determined to seek justice, not only for her daughter, but also for other families enduring similar tragedies. Joseph first became eligible for parole in 1987, as scheduled. This would be one of many for the murderer, and Rosemary would go on to protest the notion of releasing her daughter's murderer every step of the way. That 1987 bid for parole was denied, but any joy over this small win deflated when the family realized that he would be up for parole again only six years later. They would have to relive Joan's terrifying last moments and the evil actions Joseph McGowan took against her every six or so years until they, or the killer, died. Or worse, his parole was granted. According to Rosemary, she was told, if you didn't fight to keep him in, there was a very strong possibility he would get out. She couldn't risk that, and couldn't stand by while people like Joseph McGowan were allowed to walk free. During the 1993 parole hearing, Rosemary passionately advocated for her daughter, successfully preventing Joseph's parole for a second time. She didn't stop there. Determined to honor Joan's memory and protect other children, Rosemary began tirelessly campaigning for Joan's law. 
Eventually, her efforts were joined by her two youngest sons, Michael and John, who never knew their sister, but feared her murderous release. Jones Law aimed to deny parole to predators who murdered children under 14, in conjunction with a sexual offense, sparing families from the trauma of parole hearings and preventing further harm to children. The de Alessandro family's persistent advocacy paid off when New Jersey's courts passed Jones Law into legislative use on April 3, 1997. However, the law wasn't retroactive, leaving Joseph McGowan eligible for parole appeals. Despite this, Rosemary expressed gratitude for the law's potential to protect others and spare families from enduring similar tragedies. The momentum continued as a version of Jones Law was signed into federal law by Bill Clinton on October 30, 1998, and adopted by New York in 2004. The significance of the New York signing, which occurred publicly in Harriman State Park, where Jones' body was found, underscored the law's importance in protecting children. Governor George E. Pataki thanked the D'Alessandro family for their tireless advocacy, acknowledging their role in preventing similar tragedies. In 2017, New Jersey expanded Jones' law to protect all children under 18. Despite this progress, other states have yet to implement similar legislation. Rosemary's activism extended beyond Jones' law, leading to the passage of another law in New Jersey in 2000, eliminating the statute of limitations for wrongful death actions in certain cases. Rosemary's advocacy also uncovered a trust set up by Joseph McGowan's family, intended to support him upon release. This discovery made by retired FBI agent John Douglas highlighted the need to keep Joseph incarcerated. Joseph McGowan passed away in prison on June 5, 2021, never receiving parole. Despite the loss of her daughter's murderer, Rosemarie continued her fight for child safety through Jones Joy, a memorial foundation established in 1998. Jones Joy focuses on promoting child safety, advancing victims' rights, aiding neglected youth, and funding educational programs. They also offer a child safety program from the Dallas Children's Advocacy Center that trains parents and teachers on how to spot and prevent child abuse. Rosemary's commitment to Joan's legacy reflects her determination to turn tragedy into positive change, ensuring that Joan's memory lives on in protecting future generations. Throughout Joseph McGowan's time in prison, Joan's Joy held fundraising events such as garage sales to cover the legal fees involved in preventing his parole. At a particular sale in 2008, Rosemary encountered a man who offered belongings from his recently deceased mother, Sue, who had secretly been a pen pal to Joseph McGowan. Sue left behind around 250 letters from McGowan, which her son thought would assist Joan's joy. Rosemary made copies of the letters for herself, passing the originals to the parole board. McGowan's parole was denied in 2008, and these letters may have influenced that decision. Rosemary and her sons read the letters after McGowan's death, revealing his self-perception as a victim and lack of remorse for Joan's murder. Now, let's shift our focus to Joan de Alessandro and the enduring legacy of her joy. Joan adored butterflies, and the de Alessandro home remains adorned with reminders of her, including her ballet slippers, photos, and butterfly drawings. The association with butterflies grew stronger in April 2006, when Rosemary saw a cabbage white butterfly at Harriman State Park, where Joan's body was found. Since then, white butterflies have symbolized Joan's energy and spirit. In 2014, Rosemary unveiled the Joan Angela de Alessandro white butterfly sculpture and garden to commemorate the 40th anniversary of Joan's passing. This garden serves as a symbol of child safety, featuring a statue engraved with Joan's image, her story, and iterations of Joan's law. A fountain donated in 2018 symbolizes the unending importance of child safety. Rosemary's advocacy has been recognized widely. In 2004, she received an award for courage in advocating for child victims. And in 2021, Rosemary's room opened in Bergen County, providing a safe space for children. Rosemary tirelessly campaigns for child protection legislation, including expanding Joan's Law to cover individuals up to 18 years old, as in New Jersey, and renaming it Paula's Law in honor of Paula Boavesky. Through it all, Rosemary emphasizes that Joan leads the crusade for children's safety, inspiring her every action. Rosemary's dedication to her daughter's memory ensures that Joan's light, spirit, and joy will never fade. 
To support Joan's Joy, donations can be made through their website or by purchasing Rosemary's book, The Message of Light Amid Letters of Darkness, which benefits the Foundation. Additionally, Rosemary recently sat down for a candid conversation with me to share all about her journey of grief and resilience. The episode, titled Joan's Joy, will be released on the True Crime Convos podcast and available on the YouTube channel on April 3rd, 2024. Listeners will have the opportunity to hear Rosemary's powerful story firsthand and witness her unwavering commitment to child safety. As we come to the end of this episode, Rosemary's unwavering dedication to her daughter, Joan's memory, leaves an indelible mark on our hearts. Her tireless advocacy for child safety, embodied in the legacy of Joan's joy, serves as a beacon of hope for future generations. In honor of Rosemary's remarkable journey, I'll be giving away a signed copy of her book, The Message of Light Amid Letters of Darkness. Details on how to enter the giveaway can be found in the show notes. Remember, every donation to Joan's Joy contributes to the vital work of protecting children and advancing victims' rights. And as you go about your day, wherever you see a butterfly or a white butterfly, let it serve as a gentle reminder of Joan's enduring spirit and the importance of keeping her memory alive. Thank you for tuning in, and until next time, let's continue to spread Joan's joy wherever we go. If you like our podcast, please review us on Apple Podcast or your podcast player of choice. It's a really big help. Follow us on social media. We're active on Twitter for now at truecrime underscore cases, Facebook at facebook.com slash truecrimecases w laney, and Instagram at truecrimecases with laney. Our website is truecrimecasespodcast.com, and you can follow me on Instagram at Lainey Hobbs BO or on TikTok at Lainey Hobbs. And we'd love to hear your episode suggestions. Send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. This episode was researched, written, and edited by Jesse Hawk of the Inky Paw Print, with content editing by Lainey Hobbs. Audio engineering produced by the best in the business, Neeks at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or at the inkypawprint.com.